ladies and gentlemen. Dear friends, please take your seat because we have to move on. I hope that you have a nice time chit-chatting and mingling, and maybe you had time for registration for the next Future Tent 2023. And now we have to move on to our next lectures. Please take your seats so that we can move on. And we have a special privilege to welcome our Minister of Ministry of Tourism and Sport, Ms. Nikolina Vrnjac. She is here with us. Please give one round of applause for the Ministry. Thank you so much. You will address the crowd in a few minutes, maybe in 30, in 45 minutes exactly. So we are done with the first two topics for today, and that was the future of education and the future of governance. But we have one more topic of today's conference to go, and this one is maybe the most important for Croatia, and that's the future of tourism. So, the guy who's going to present this topic is very, very professional. He's the associate professor at Victoria University of Wellington and most relevant future is specialized in tourism. And just recently, he was named one of the top 25 global tourism promoters. Please welcome Mr. Jan Jaumann. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, Thank you. you can take. The stage is yours. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Oh, what am I trying to say? Dobadan. Hi. So I think it's very important from a tourism perspective. Is one of the things about tourism is you're a tourist, but fundamentally what it's all about is I'm a person, and you are. I'm coming to your home, which is Croatia. And the key issue is about, if I'm the tourist, is who is the type of person you're inviting into your home, and how does that tourist behave? Is, there somebody, is it a tourist that thrashes everything and breaks things, or is it a tourist that is kind? But it's also about you as a country in the terms of what do we mean by hospitality? How kind are we to, to, to somebody? How do we share experiences? Because tourism is about one thing only, and it's about people and how, how we socialize and how we show hospitality. That's what it's all about. But the future of tourism is shaped by a number of things. And from Croatia perspective, it's about climate change and demography. So what I'm going to talk about today is two things. This is my story about the future of tourism globally, and this is my story about the future of tourism in Croatia. So, uh, but just one caveat, anything I say, don't believe it. It might, not ha it might happen, it might not happen. But do not literally take my word, because many of the forecasts I do don't happen. Because if I, I knew exactly what the future of the world would be, I would know the lo Euro lottery numbers for the weekend and all of that type of thing. But this, but the question I'm asking is a series of questions. It's about circumstances. It's about events. So this is my yeoman yarns, my, the story of where I think the future of tourism will be. So basically, the, the, the starting point is, how do you design the futures of tourism? Um, and I use that word futures like many other speakers have talked about. I can't tell you one exact futures but I can tell you a range of futures. So this is how we design the future of tourism. And the second thing is, what is the future of tourism? So it's about understanding that design, how do you get to the future, then what could the future be in the terms of what it is. So this is my model of designing the future. I talk about a number of aspects. I talk about the drivers of change, the macro, the macro things, um, globalization, demography, wealth, distribution. I talk about the disruptors of change, and the classical example of that is COVID-19, what, what that does and how it goes. And I put all of that together, and I create scenarios. Scenarios are just future events. It's like reading what is the future of Croatia four different ways. 
Four, people, four different people are telling you their story of how they see it. So it's just an opinion. It's not fact. It's, it's a considered future. So when I talk about the mega drives of change, I talk about these big eight, big eight drivers. And um, I'd be here for the next three hours if I just wanted to talk about them all. So you'd all probably all be snoozing or falling asleep. I can't do a six hour presentation. So if I just look at one of those drivers of change, which is affluence and inequality, because affluence is the main driver of tourism. Tourism in its economic growth has come from wealth. So if you ask any tourist in the middle classes, if you had extra money, if you ask consumers, if you had extra money, what would you do? And it's always, I want to take an international holiday. They want to visit another place. And that's been the core driver of global tourism, which went from 25 million in 1950 to, to 1.3 billion in, in 2019. And it's, it's not about something very general. What you need to do when you design in the future is to drill down and look at how do the aspects of how do the aspects of affluence shape the future? So it's, it's things like the indulgence equation. We've got this tourist that's out there. They want to go on holiday. They want to come to Croatia. They want to go to Italy. But the other thing they're asking themselves, if I come to Croatia or do something, what is the impact of it? Because today's consumer, right at the forefront of what they do, is sustainability and sustainable lifestyle. Your car market is Germany. The Germans are, are sustainable consumers. So, so if I'm coming to Croatia, what's the impact? How do I, what do I trade off? So it's understanding that equation. Another example is the disparity of inequality of tourism. So the tourists that go on holiday and stay in five-star resorts, their wealth is humongous. You know, the very elite. And those that serve them are, the working, are fundamentally the working classes. So the disparity between those that serve you and those that consumption is huge. So it's about that relationship, about what is tourism and what, and what it isn't. So there's some of the examples, because you can't take the broad macro drivers and say this is going to happen. You need to understand them within the context of tourism or the concept of any, any other sector. So. What I tend to do is take all of those trends and, and put them through a very simple matrix. So when COVID-19 arrived, I said to myself, how does tourism change? You ask the questions, you take all of these trends. In a COVID-19 world, what would be the dominant trends? What would be the advancing trends? But fundamentally, what are the trends that are going to stop or slow down? And what are the trends that will disappear? So we asked that question for New Zealand, for example. We said, you know, there's a big difference in New Zealand when we closed our borders in March 2020 between an international tourist and a domestic tourist. That they do different things. A domestic tourist in New Zealand took a holiday for four point, on average four point four and a half nights, whereas the international tourist in New Zealand is 21 nights. So they do different things. So it's asking that question. And it's the same as, who is the food tourist? What are the trends that they follow? So it's just an example of that. The next question I ask in part of this equation, I look for disruptors. Because fundamentally, tourism is about international arrivals. About, it's a linear progression. And you ask the question, how do the external environment, how do they disrupt that? So th things like, um, I, I, we're in, for example, a permanent disruptor which will change tourism is climate change. You know, very much the language of today has been accelerated by COVID-19. 2019, the word was sustainable, sustainability. The word today is regenerative in the terms of that. So the words have changed. So we're at that tipping point. Everybody accepts climate, accepts climate change, and there's no reversal. Whereas temporal disruptors are fundamentally things like uh, economic recessions. You know, the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008 was a blip. Tourism's quickly, quickly recover. War and terrorism is not new. 
fundamentally, the classic rule is if you have war or tourism, the tourist does not go to that destination, but they go somewhere else. It's displaced. The key question is, do those temporal disruptors become more permanent? Do they become more permanent in the terms of what they do? So the unanswered question is, what are the consequences of war in Ukraine? What does that do for disposable income, inflation, etc., etc.? When does it become permanent or as a tipping point? So when you're looking at the future, to get my scenarios, there's two, there's two lenses I used. The first lens is the past, the historical lens. So basically, tourism is about the past. The reasons why tourists go to Paris haven't changed in 200 years. It's something to do with the Eiffel Tower. It's something to do with wine. It's something to do with the beach. Destinations fundamentally do not alter their product or experiences. The main reasons to travel to a destination are still the iconic places you go, you go and what you do. Because place, tourism is about place and product. It's about its geography. So history is very important, a historical lens. Or do you talk about a transformational lens? You have something that's so unthinkable, it's an alternative future. It's a more radical future. And this is the lens I talk about in the terms of science fiction, thinking the impossible, thinking the unbelievable. And if you want to know more, they're my two books. They're available. OK, sorry. OK, so they're the two lenses I use. So putting that all into context, what does that mean for tourism here? So I, scenario, I'm a scenario planner. My background was I was the scenario planner for the Scottish Tourist Board. We're back in 2000 and back in 2002. And when you're doing scenarios, you're asking the question, what are the two fundamental drivers of change or trends that will shape your future? Because you can't, you can't do everything. You've got to decide what are the trends I think are going to be more important and will be focal or more useful for me. So I am saying the future of tourism is fundamentally about two things. It's about the distribution of wealth and resources. You're asking the question, where will wealth be? A very basic question, if Germany is your car market, how rich will they be? What's their, what's their elasticity? What's wealth by different cohorts? And that type of thing. And the other question is societal behaviors towards sustainability. It's not about sustainability per se. It's about the decisions we take about sustainability, because we know what's going to happen. But it, so it's, it's about leadership and the decisions we take in order to change the world. So they're the two things. If you combine those both, I, I'm saying wealth is scarcer in the future, or wealth, there's lots of wealth in the future. I am saying our attitudes towards sustainability are two things. It's, it's me first, because tourism is fundamentally about me. I'm going on holiday to do all of those naughty and nice things. You know Las Vegas? If it happens in Vegas, it stays in Vegas. We do naughty and nice things. Or is it about community? Do we take a more of a, a, a utopian approach to the decisions we make? And we put all of that together, I get four scenarios. The future is one about the mass middle classes. The other one's a perfect storm where there's a series of disasters and things going wrong. There's a cirrhosis of decline. The third scenario is planet Earth. So what does a pure future about sustainability look like when we've taken a very strong community perspective but within the context of some growth? But what do we mean by growth? And the final scenario is about singularity. This is a world where technology fundamentally changes society. So I take all of those together and ask the questions, what do they mean for tourism in the terms of where, in the terms of where we go? So let's explore these macro scenarios. But fundamentally, I'm asking the question, what do they mean for you? Because I will paint a picture. I will ask questions, but it will be you as an industry that finds the answer and de decides the roadmap of the decisions you're going to take. So the first scenario is about the mass middle classes. This is a predictive future. It's based upon a lot of evidence. We know what the economic distribution of wealth 
is globally and what it's going to do. And if we know that, we can make strong predictions about where the future of tourism is. And this is all about what we call unconstrained demand. It's, about a, dem it's a demand future. So what I'm trying to say in, in this world, if I look, take the, the evidence from the, the Brookings Institute, in 2020, there was 3.9 billion people that were classified as middle class in the world. But that have in the terms of purchasing power. By 2050, in the terms of purchasing power, consumer middle classes, the 6.8 billion people. Give or take a billion. It all depends on the scenario that you're going to use. Because at the moment, that is the driver of change. That driver of a consumer society has driven the growth in world tourism. So what does it mean for tourism? So if I take the UNWTO global statistics for tourism, I'm talking about tourism globally around 4 billion tourists. And that's a huge shift from 1.3 billion tourists to 4 billion tourists. And that's the number of holidays we take. It's not the number of people. What, you know, this is Ian, your name. I might take three or four holidays. It's the number of international arrivals. In Europe, it's about 1.4 billion tourists. And Europeans are different. You're not like New Zealanders. You know, we, we count tourism when you cross the border. So this is international arrivals. Uh, in the terms of, for Croatia, if it's unconstrained demand, your potential is an extra 9 million tourists by 2050. That's, your base now is about 17 million, so it's an extra 9 million by 2050 if we take that demand. And this doesn't consider climate change, does not consider demography, it's a straight projection based upon economics. Okay? So this is a scenario, what drives that consumer is the experience economy. This is a tourist that's wanting something very different. It's not something about, they're wanting novelty, they're wanting, they want to sample innovation. This is about, you know, it's that, I don't know what, it's that little cricket on the little cocktail stick. But tourists are excited about something new. And right at the representation of the changes in the experience economy has been about, has been about food. If you take where, where, because food today represents the experience economy because it's the only thing, you don't watch it, you, you don't listen to it, it's the only experience where you consume it. And food is very exciting in the terms of that. The other thing is about the, what we call the indulgence equation. So I want to go on holiday. I want to be naughty. You know, I want to do something that I can't do at all. But it's what the offset is. The key question is here is about if you want the tourist to be naughty and hedonistic activity, it's what the impact would be. So this is about legislative frameworks, about offsetting. It's about mitigating circumstances about the future so that they, they feel they can do this activity without feeling it's bad or naughty. So it's, it's about how you treat that. So uh, there's a couple of examples of, or signals of this trend happening, happening now. So for example, I talk about this is corona. This is not coronavirus. You've all heard of the corona beer? Well, tourists are out, they want to do something new and novelty. So when we tend to look at what are the ideas out there which we can pinch from society, what do they mean from tourists? The tourist, from an experience economy perspective, wants to learn something new. They want to do something. So it's all about entertainment, but I want to add something to me. So this is corona's this is the, a Corona vending machine, and it basically says to you, if you want a beer, you can all, you've got to speak to the vending machine, and you can only order it in Spanish. You can only get this beer if you say it in Spanish. If you see what I mean. So basically, it's trying to say, to, to, it's trying to say in the terms of products and experiences, you know, I want you to learn something. I want you to learn a few words of Spanish in my language, because it's about some a sense of achievement in the terms. So before I consume that beer, I've learned something, I've offset something. So it's just a little thing like that in the terms of engagement. The other thing we've got to say is, you can't hide from climate change. 
And fundamentally, Croatia, it, it, it's a coastal destination. You've got blue seas, you've got beautiful islands, and you've got to say, how do I mitigate? What do I do about climate change? So from a legislative framework perspective, look to Norway. Look what the Nordic countries are doing to mitigate and adapt in the terms of what they do, in the terms of what would the future boat look like. It's all about the hydrogen economy. It's all about electricity. So again, you mitigate. Like, you know, I, can take, I can take that cruise. I can do that because the impact is not huge. Other examples, you know, as we move into this world of climate change, it leads to innovation and new experiences. So we then look at the design of the electric airplane. And one of the beautiful things, these are sea gliders. So I'm thinking about all of the islands off the Ad Adriatic coast, and how do you get from A to B as a luxury experience. Sea gliders basically work from the, the engines and the propellers, they glide across the water because they're, they're taking, it's the, it's, the, it's the waves, it's, it's the things that, that are coming up from the sea, they, dry, they drive the plane, so they're flying at low levels. So again, it's a, it's a luxury experience, but it mitigates, it adapts in the terms of doing things. So fundamentally, what I'm trying to say, in this market, in the experience economy market, you've got to innovate. Because what you're presently doing, from a tourism perspective, is not good enough. The tourist always becomes more demanding, more sophisticated, and is looking for something that's new and novel in the terms of doing something. So if you want this market of an extra 11 million tourists, how do you change the product and the experience? How do you device, diversify it and make it new? The second scenario is a prognosis scenario. It's likely to happen. It has a degree of feasibility. This is a scenario of uh, economic contagion of events. It's things like, how will demography change Europe? It's all about global inequality of wealth scarcity of resources, inflation. So what do these mean? So the, the biggest thing that's important for me in this scenario is what the tourists do. When the tourist has less money, their behavior changes. Where the tourist has money, they seek knowledge, novelty, and adventure. Where the tourist has less money, they seek simplicity. They spend less. They, they, nature becomes important. Connectivity with the family becomes important. It's, we're not spending on the... You know, in New Zealand, is, the tourist doesn't go bungee jumping, for example. They, they're going out trekking or hiking. Or in New Zealand, we say it's tramping. So it's a different type of experience. In this scenario, there's also opportunity. If you look at the concept of demography, basically the world is getting older, but there's less children. So we've hit the point of what we call the peak child in the terms of population growth. There's going to be fundamentally less children in the world. But this becomes an opportunity. The opportunity is grandparents are living longer, so the child, from a commodity perspective, becomes more important. The grandparents want to spend more time with them, so you get the concept of what we call grand travelers in the terms of it's a change of demo demography in this type of thing. And the other one is, in this type of trend, is the patterns of behavior and purchase change. We become more of a planner in the terms of what tourism is. This is fundamentally um, females who hold the purchase strings for family holidays. They're searching longer and deeper for value and thrift. So this, is for a destination, is about content and about making sure that content of what we can do in the terms of itinerary and a purchase is very, very clear. So we, we lose a lot. Of, we search deeper and longer with this. Specifically, and more importantly, females do, who make the decisions of, of purchase. The benefit of this scenario from a Croatian perspective is your tourism product depends upon Europe. And if you look at income inequality, Europe has an even distribution of wealth compared to lots of inequality in North America, lots of inequality in Asia. So it's more robust. Europe is more robust to a recession compared to 
compared to North America and Asia, where you haven't got the social welfare system to, um, is, is, is that safe, safety trap. Europe fundamentally has a welfare system. So if you, if you talked about this scenario happening in the terms of this, we're probably talking about global tourism at 2.2 billion tourists, but Europe is it a million tour is it a billion tourists? So Europe, European tourism would move from 700 million international arrivals to a billion. So it's relatively strong because it's not about long haul; it's about short domestic trips. From a Croatian perspective, so your worst case scenario is an extra six million tourists by 2050, if you take it that forecast line, because your dependency is Europe in the terms of your core markets that are around you. So in, in this scenario, basically, I'm an optimist. Where you have economic downfall or economic recession or a bad world, it's all about what is the opportunity. So for example, I look at an aging population not as a bad thing, but as an opportunity. You know, those seniors have got time and they've got wealth, and what do they do? So, so every bad scenario still has good markets and still has opportunities. What I'm trying to say, it's not the end of the world, all right? But these two scenarios are based upon unconstrained demand. Basically, it's where wealth will be. The other two scenarios are fundamentally about, the next two scenarios I'm going to talk are about, about how does the external environment beyond wealth shape the future. So the third scenario is planet Earth. This is a world of climate change. This is a world of dystopia, your worst scenario, your worst nightmare. But where you have dystopia, you always have utopia. Because when we have COVID-19, the only thing we can think about is hope. How do we come out of COVID-19? So from dystopia emerges utopia, from despair emerges hope. Because I'm a believer that humankind can overcome problems. Okay? You don't bury your head in the sand. You address the problem, and you do something about it. So I lived through COVID-19, but I grew up in the United Kingdom. I grew up through war, Northern Ireland. And Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland are fundamentally they're peaceful destinations now. Tourism is booming in those countries. So I'm optimistic about the future. So let's throw some facts at you. So we're living in this world where the tourist, let's say the German tourist, they're keen on sustainability. They live their life through the garden. How many of your friend, how many of you in the audience has a friend that has an allotment or, or a garden where they grow vegetables? See? You're doing that. So you're interested in this living sustainably and doing something about it. So sustainability is a core virtue. When I went to school, when I went to school, we were taught about women's rights, gender inequality, and apartheid. There were the, study, there were the issues of liberal, liberalism and social issues. But today, children, it's all about climate. That's the issue. They're the issues they bring home to talk to you about. So it comes about, and we change things. We live in this climate change way. And the typical example of that is the climatation diet. So we're talking about when you go out for a menu, is what's, what, what's the carbon footprint? What's the CO2 emissions of this diet? The move across society from meat-based diets to vegetable-based diets has been huge. So it's, it's no longer from a British perspective, you know, it's, it's, it's roast beef and Yorkshire puddings and, and roast potatoes. It's not that anymore. Food has fundamentally shifted. It, we've, gone more ve we've gone more vegetarian, not vegetarian, but veganism. So climate change diets are mainstream now in the terms of where we go. But the elephant in the room is without doubt this. From a Croatian perspective, looking at the data from the IPPC or the World Bank, fundamentally it's saying in the last 40 years, the mean temperature in Croatia has gone up by two degrees. And that's significant. That's significant in the terms of where we do, because it's temperature and the climate, where we do, because it's temperature and the climate that determines your geography what the food is of a nation, and, and what the tourism product is. 
So if we look to the future and take that data, what is, what is, what is the IPPC saying about Croatia? They're fundamentally saying by 2040, which is 18 years away, 18 years away, your lifetime, that the, means, the mean scenario, so this is the probable scenario, that you're going to see a temperature rise of 2.29, 2, 2.2 degrees. And that's huge. That is significant. A worst case scenario, you go up between 2040 to 2049 by three and a half degrees. So that shifts and changes your tourism products and experience. And that's in the net, that's by 2040 in the terms of where it goes. So the third, the third scenario I'm going to talk about. So no, this is the perfect store. The perfect store, this scenario, basically, and what I'm trying to say to you is, is how do you mitigate and adapt? So this is not about any wealth. This is about decisions you take. So for example, what does Europe do? What does the European Union do? So one possibility in the terms of that is, would you limit the number of international arrivals coming to Croatia? Would you say, instead of 17 million tourists that were here on, in Croatia, it's only 10 million? And that's a big step, because that's all about degrowth. But it's not a question of economics. The key question in terms of uncertainty is, what would those 10 million tourists look like? What's the value of those types of tourists from an economic, culturally, and social perspective? It's not the same tourist as the past. But you've got to ask the question, what capacity-wise, what if it's just 10 million international arrivals by 2050 for a number of reasons? Because why do I say that? This should not be tourism globally or in Croatia in the terms of relationship. It's not a tourist, it's, it's about the relationship between you as the tourist and, and the community. You do not want a tourist which says, I'm coming to Croatia because it's, ba it's basic, it's authentic, it's unspoiled. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's a nice place to come because the other tourist is saying, Let's keep it that way. Let's keep everybody in poverty. Because tourism has to be for the betterment of society. Remember that. So in this planet Earth scenario, it's about what we call regenerative tourism. Regenerative tourism is this disposing utopian future. And we talk about this and what it looks like. So this is just a case study from Mexico. Hola, welcome to Playa Viva, a regenerative boutique hotel located right here at the Pacific Ocean in Mexico. But it's more than just a hotel. It's a complete project. Sembrada nuestros propios alimentos orgánicos. To bioconstruction materials that serve multiple functions inside our ecosystem. Just look around. Railings, lights, and furniture, all made from bamboo growing here on site. Playa Viva is 100% energía solar. Our farm-to-table kitchen is committed to having multiple relationships with local food producers. Aquí le mostramos cómo pasa de semilla a chocolate. Our pigs are an important part of our team. They consume food waste from our kitchen. Al igual que nuestras lechugas, frutas y verduras, otorgan una cosecha llena de nutrientes para nuestros huéspedes veganos y vegetarianos. We invite you to get to know our epic yoga shala through the exploration of body and mind. Trabajamos con comunidades locales para promover ecosistemas más resilientes, empezando por salud y oportunidades económicas, mientras promovemos nuestros recursos naturales. Our community outreach work doesn't just end at the closest town of Huichuca, it extends all the way up the watershed. As part of the Playa Viva Health Program, we sponsor the youth soccer team, providing coaches, equipment, and field maintenance, and always making sure to have lots of fun! <laughs> Since 2010, La Tortuga Viva has hatched over 500,000 hatchlings and involved Playa Viva guests, school groups, local communities on exciting and transformational baby sea turtle releases, and much more.
Everything that we do here at Playviva matches with our core values. Creating and promoting biodiversity. Promoviendo una comunidad con mucho sentido. Crear energía limpia. Transformational experiences. And create a living legacy. So I hope you got a little bit of a taste mm. of what makes Playa Viva so special. And the next time you take a trip, it's one where your vacation meets your values. Look at that. There's a global movement across the world about regenerative thinking and regenerative agriculture and regenerative tourism, and it's, it's, it's unstoppable in the terms of where we're going. There's many people that are saying out there that tourism at, at the moment is unsustainable, and how, we, how do you respond to that in the, terms of what it do, in the terms of what it does? So basically, regenerative tourism is based on a concept of regenerative agriculture. And it's about changing a farming system so it's climate change positive. It's about mitigating and adapting, but going beyond that to changing the system, changing how we farm and how we portray and what we do in the terms of far farming. So it has a positive aspect. So there's a number of people across the world, fundamentally, uh, and the people that are right at the forefront of this debate, by some sort of coincidence, they're fundamentally all female. So I don't know what that says about me. Um, but if you look at people like Susan Beckham, Pauline Sheldon, um, they fundamentally they've driven the debate about this in the terms of tourism has to change in the terms of where we go. So a regenerative system is basically taking a, white, a blank piece of paper and it's about redesigning what, what you want tourism to be. It's the relationship between values, place, relationships, and your practice. And practice is the key part, is how do you do tourism? What is the value system, and how do you design that type of experience in the terms of go, going forward? So it's a very different model of what we've got in many parts of the world. So the final scenario is um, scenario four. Singularity has arrived. And if you're a futurist, you've got to do technology. You've got to do spaceships and flying cars. You've got to have a robot somewhere. And many of the other speakers have talked about that concept. You saw the Boston Dynamic woof woof on four legs coming in. Is anybody going to take one home? No. But you saw that. So this is the concept of, sing of singularity has arrived. Singularity is the point in the future based upon the exponential growth of technology which results in superintelligence. And what I mean by superintelligence is, it's the point in the future where you date the robot. It's the point in the future where they match you in the terms of being a human. You can have that conversation. They can do things for you. It's the work of Ray Kurzweil in the terms of, it's the terms of things. But it, to me, it's not about the future is all about robots. It's the technological advancement and all of the bits and bobs that have gone into the robot. So it's things like exoskeleton suits. And what's that? What, that, that has meant, if you think about Iron Man, you know, that, 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 that suit. And what, what's that? Do? For example, what, what the exoskeleton suit is doing for people that are um, physically f f f f are weak in the terms of mobility, what will... What will what, what will that look like? Think about the 80-year-old or 85-year-old climbing a mountain in an exoskeleton suit in a couple of hours because they've got that framework and that strength. Look at the advancements we've seen in speech recognition. And speech recognition has been exponential growth. You, you've probably all got some sort of Alexa or a, a, Amazon Assistant in your house that tells you information in the terms of doing things. In New Zealand, we have a company called Soul Machines. And Soul Machines is one of the world's advanced companies in the terms of speech recognition. You can, it's the, these are fundamentally virtual assistants, which can have a conversation with you, can book appointments with you, and take decisions for you. The scary things about some of this technology are things like brain-computer interfaces. This is where you just, I think, one of you, this is where you just think and something happens. This is where you can move objects without physically moving the object. So if anybody used to have slot cars or scale electric, 
You know, you can, you, you can get applications where you just think car go faster, car go slower in the terms of doing things. But now, in the terms of um, digital, in the terms of marketing an analytics, it's when you're looking through a camera, you run a website, and you know that camera can make a decision about how you're thinking about the booking process, how you're engaging with, you know, with the website. Um, and if you think of companies like um, Real Time out of Estonia where they're using this information. What's your facial expression? How do you feel about this advert? Do you feel happy? Do you feel sad? All of this type of thing. So it's bringing lots of data in the terms of techniques and what you do. So it's not about the robots are going to arrive and take over, but it's the technological advancement that goes into all of this that changes tourism. So my key question is, you see, have you seen Westworld? The HBO series. So my question to you is, if you take all of this technological advancement, what would your Westworld look like? You know, a, a theme park or a resort all about robotic experiences and run by robots in the terms of that. Because the key issue here is not about climate change, but it's about demography. You're a nation where you're leaving. You're getting older and you're leaving. So in 2050, we talked about one scenario, an extra 11 million people. So how would you service them? Who would make the bed? Who would cook the meal? Because I think you've got a population at the moment around 4 million. 2050, you're hitting 3.1, 3.2 million people. You're losing, in 40 years, you will lose 25% of your population. And fundamentally, the people you will lose are those people that you want to keep. Because the hospitality industry is fundamentally, usually about 70% of those that work in the hospitality industry are under the age of 30. The more educated a population becomes, going to university, doing qualifications, the higher tendency to move on to find a better job in the terms of wealth. So key questions about what you're doing. And you've heard from a whole range of speakers about this. So this is the other issue. So the two constraining factors for your future or climate change and demography, the number of people that you've got, you've got here in the terms of what, what you'll be. But there's, there's a couple of ideas in the terms of innovation. There's companies like um, um, Morley Robotics. Morley Robotics is a starter company out of, out of the UK, and basically they're saying, okay, if there's going to be no chefs in the world, maybe the robot can cook dinner for you. So if you go to their demonstration kitchen, it, it can produce, it can do 400, 400 recipes to, to Michelin star standard. You know, the robot, the robot will make it for you. And as you've seen with exponential growth, what the robot looked like 20 years, 20 years ago is fundamentally what the, the robot is today and where they will be in, in another 20 to 30 years. So if you look at the um, development of Boston Dynamics, if you look at the videos from 20 years ago, what they are today and where they're going, they're chalk and cheese. They're chalk and cheese. Do you know what I mean by chalk and cheese? Chalk and cheese, as the British said, very different. Okay, simple as that. But the other thing is climate change. In this scenario, this science fiction scenario, is I'm, I'm going to take it to, to, to extremes. So in one aspect, this is happening now. So if we just look at sea level rises in Croatia and what it means, more dramatic storms. So basically, the Adriatic coast is about resorts. So what point in the future do they become unsustainable? What point in the future is the mitigation and adaption? It's, it's not cost effective. And this is already changing you. So tourism in the Adriatic is not about June and July. It's not about July and August, it's about Easter and it's about September. So the seasons are shifting. And if the season's shifting, it has a huge knock-on effect in the terms of the family market, because school holidays and all of that. And if we go to the extreme, so in one of the scenarios I talked about 2040 to 2059, but if I talk about 2060 to 2079, or the end of the scenarios, I'm talking about a mean temperature of three and a half degrees. And I'm talking 2080, 
of a mean temperature increase of four and a half degrees. And if that happens and that occurs, tourism becomes unsustainable. The tourist simply does not want to come. It's too hot. Okay? You just do not want to come. It's too hot. Because there's a point of bearability of what I want to do. So in this scenario, what does your West world look like? It's about throwing technology to create an artificial experience. It's fundamentally, how can you use sustainable design in, the, in building clusters of what will the future resort look like that mitigates and adapts to this environment? And this is fundamentally Las Vegas. If you think about Las Vegas, it's a destination in the desert, isn't it? It, 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 it's it's, it's man-made. So it's in the design, sustainable architecture is the balance between nature and design in the terms of innovation. And you have to look at things like the Intercontinental at Shanghai and what that's achieved, because that's an that's a eco-destination that's won lots of awards, built in a quarry. But it's up for sale at the moment, so if you've got, I think it's for sale for about 400, 450 US dollars. Because fundamentally, we do like resorts. So regenerative tourism is fundamentally about small communities. But this scenario is about what does the resort look like? Because the tourist does like the resort because they feel safe. They cocoon. It's inclusive. Because fundamentally, tourism is about I want to switch off and I want to relax in the terms of this. So my question to you is, what will your Westworld resort look like in the year 2050 in the terms of where it goes with technology and experience and design? Anyway, if I put all of those together, what's my, what are my messages to Croatia? First of all, if I take the four scenarios, scenario one, the mass middle class, is about what does an extra 9 million tourists look like in 2050? It's not just about volume, it's about the value. You need to design innovative tourism experiences. An extra 9 million tourists, in the terms of that, takes you down to visitor management strategies, takes you to over-tourism and capacity thresholds. And how do you manage in the terms of offset in the terms of the indulgence equation? If you've got that second scenario, it's about how do you design a system that's resilient through the storms? How do you design policies and strategies that get you through something like COVID-19 and being bad? But, often, but pessimistically, what's an extra six million tourists look like? And what I'm also trying to say is there's always, when you've got adversity and downturn, there's always going to be opportunity. I'm also saying, in the third scenario, tourism, it's tourism with a regenerative process and a regenerative purpose. I'm saying Croatian tourism is a series of, it's a series of regenerative communities in, in their own right. And what I'm trying to say is tourism is part of the solution rather than being the problem. So you're turning tourism completely round. You're saying tourism is the answer. And the final scenario is about whatever you think the future of technology is going to be, it won't be. It will be radically different. Because what we haven't seen what's coming. So many of you today are listening to this talk and you're fiddling through your little um, your phone. Next year, as um, Mike, Mike talked about, you won't be, you'll be twitching. You'll be twitching with your Google glasses. Twitch, 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 just like that. <laughs> Nervous twitch, that's what you'll be doing. That's what he said, so swiping's gone. It's twitchy, 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 twitchy. <laughs> okay? Big issue in this scenario um, is about, so it's about that. So that, therefore, sorry, you've thrown me. The other key issue is you can't have a future without people. So the constraint of demography will shape your future as well. You know, if you want guests, you've got to have chefs. Simple as that. And the, the final point I want to make, um, we like gated communities as equal resorts and what they will look like. So if I put all of that together, there's no one answer. I've got four scenarios there. Some of the key things is, how do you move, how do you move from your present model, which is the mass middle classes, that's where I see 
what you're doing at the moment, how do you move it, for example, to that planet Earth scenario? What would the decisions you'd have to take in order to move from scenario A to scenario B? And again, what happens if the future, if the future was, what if the future is the future you don't want or can't control? What would you do if you move from this mass middle classes to, to that perfect storm in the terms of prognosis? What would your response be in your decisions in the terms of where you're going? In other words, in this concept of singularity is everywhere. How do some of the concepts of singularity appear in all three, in all three other scenarios in the terms of doing things? So if you put all of those scenarios together, the key question I'm saying is, what is your scenario? Because tourism is your first industry. But it's not just about being the first industry from an economic perspective. It has to be the first industry from a cultural perspective, a social perspective, an environmental perspective. You've got to have the will of the people and the tourists to, to be there. It's not just about an economic forecast, it's got to be the nation of Croatia, because tourism is their industry, not, not the minister's industry, from inverted commas. And if you can do that, tourism becomes the first industry of Croatia, but the everlasting, in, the everlasting industry of Croatia. You've got to have a system, a process, or a tourism industry that will be in the future, and the type of future that you've wanted. Thank you. Thank you so much for this brilliant lecture and your insights and your homework about Croatia. You know everything. I, <laughs> I, I, I hope the minister is really satisfied. We will see this in a, in a few minutes because she's now down there in the backstage. So what are we going to do now is we're going to answer some of the questions from the audience. They are here. So the first one, do you think we could soon offer services like Westworld does? Yes, mm -hmm. you can. Yes. But you do not want a situation where the ro if you've seen the, the first series with Euro Brenner, the 1980s version, where the tourists take over the campsite and, and shoot everybody. You do not want that. But we've got <laughs> technological experiences that we do with that. So that technology is already there in the terms of, of, what, of what we do. So, so the answer yes. is yes. Yeah, the answer is yes, yes. Because um, Westworld is fundamentally an adult fantasy uh, mm -hmm. in the terms of what it is. And you know, it's, it's, beyond, it's beyond Disneyland, it's, it's that Vegas story understanding what that experience is. Mm. Yeah, so what happens in Croatia stays in Croatia. Croatia. That's true. <laughs> OK, what is a post-pandemic change in tourism you've least expected but still happened? Mm, that's an interesting what one. What is the post-pandemic change in tourism? Change you in tourism. You least expect it. Something well, that you didn't oops. expect. I did a, we did a series of scenarios for the New Zealand government, um, and they're all online, what we do. And, and the scenario that has occurred is everybody in New Zealand thought what are we going to do? It's going to, what will be the new normal? But the scenario that's unfolding is we've gone back really? mm -hmm. to, to what we're doing. Nobody, nobody's wearing masks. Everybody thought we'd be wearing masks for the next five years. So the least thing I expected was um, going back to the old normal extremely quickly. And the terms of the recovery was extremely fast. Mm. So that was the least thing I expected. But that's a good thing, then. That's good. It is a good it thing um, of what, where it was. OK. Are robots our future tourists? <laughs> yes, of course. It's a nice group. Yes, it was. So if you believe in iRobot in the terms of that, so it's a new market. Mm -hmm. Nobody globally is, do, is doing, is, is nobody globally is marketing to robots for holidays. Maybe Croatia should be the first nation to do that. Do they pay money? <laughs> of course. So okay, that, that, that's we'll the opportunity. So we'll ask the minister about the plans. We'll ask for that minister. Robot tourists. The third one. How realistic, realistic is to expect that the, we could include our tourists to help and keep sustainability of our economy through their behavior? Mm -hmm. You have to do it. Your core market is Germany. Simple as that. And if you're not sustainable, the Germans will vote with their feet. Because it's this indulgence, indulgence equation. More and more often, people are making decisions about where to go on holiday about, from a sustainability. Sustainability is what we call a hygiene factor. It's non-negotiable. So you've got, to, you've, you've got to get that right. Um, and the world has changed. OK, that's it. Huh? Thank you. Okay. And now is the time to introduce our special.